Hey, friends, let's stand up together uh, just in honor of God's word. And uh, Miss Marissa Burrow is going to come and read our scripture for us. The scripture for today's sermon comes from Philippians 1, 21 through 26. The word of God speaks to us like this. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that, because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Marissa. You guys can grab a seat. And uh, if, if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and let's make our way to Philippians together. Um, if you are new to the Bible, or uh, you're, you're, you're new to Christianity, you're not familiar with the Bible, you don't have to pretend. That is so okay. Like, we are a family. We're learning together. We're learning this stuff together. So, uh, if you've got a Bible, you'll, you'll need it, um, which, which should go without saying, but it, it doesn't often. But we're going to head to Philippians chapter 1. Um, Hey, if you don't own a Bible, if you would say, hey, I'm, I'm borrowing one or I just don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. So uh, at that welcome table on your way out after the gathering, there are Bibles over there. Please take one of those. Uh, that is for you. And even again, like you don't have to be like, well, I, I'm not a follower of Jesus or I, I don't know what I believe about this. Am I allowed to? Yeah, please take a Bible. Consider the things of Christ uh, with us. Um, we believe that God speaks through his word. We believe that his word is authoritative. We love the Bible. And um, so I, like I, th- I think we need to take time now. Let's just ask God to speak. Um, I, I think there's a lot of, like I feel a bit of distraction in my heart. And I want to be present to this word. I, f- I feel like there's a bit of distract, like maybe more distraction than normal um, today. So let's just pray that God would help us to be present. Father, we... Um, We pray that you would give us the faith and the courage to open our hearts and our lives to your word. We ask, Spirit, that you would give us understanding. I I pray that you would help us to see things that we just can't see without your help. More than anything, God, we want you to satisfy us with the good news of Jesus, with the gospel, with the truth of Jesus in our place, and Jesus making all things new. We're thankful for your word, God. We, We don't take it for granted that we have your word, that you would love us enough to actually tell us the truth through your word about who you are, who we are, and what you have done to rescue us. May we be a people of your book through the power and presence of your spirit. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Um, So we started a few weeks ago, we started a series in the book of Philippians. Philippians is this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and I want to catch you up to just kind of where we've been. So Philippi was this this group of churches in modern-day Greece. So if you were to go to Greece now, you could go to some of the places where Paul's writing this stuff. And he's writing to this church. Like, Paul loved all the churches that he wrote to. I I think as you read Philippi, it's pretty easy to be like, I think Paul might have had a favorite church. The tone and the tint, like the way that he writes to these believers, it it just stands out as unique. Um, You can read about the story of this church beginning in Acts chapter 16. It's really this remarkable story of God rescuing people and this church being birthed through these people who you you wouldn't have thought like should hang out together because they didn't have anything, anything in common. So this church is birthed. And then later on, Paul is in prison for proclaiming the gospel, and he writes this letter, Philippians, to this church that he loved a whole lot. And he wanted them to know, like we saw this as we've we've started studying this, he wanted them to know that what was happening to him was actually serving to advance the gospel. 
They were really concerned about Paul because he's in prison in Rome and Paul wants him to know, not that like, oh, prison's great and it's like being in Cabo and it's a retreat here and it's one, but he's saying, hey, what's happening to me, God is turning the plans of the enemy and of Rome on its head and the gospel is actually continuing to go forth. And rather than other people being afraid, like, well, Paul was thrown in jail, I don't want to be thrown in jail, he says, What's happened to me has actually caused boldness in other brothers and sisters. That They're saying, we want to proclaim the gospel now. And he wants them to know that God was with him, that God had a plan. It's like even though Paul's in prison, even though Paul's suffering, even though we saw at the end of the text last week, Donnie showed us that there were other followers of Jesus, other pastors who were preaching the gospel with impure motives. And their motives were... Like, they wanted to somehow shame Paul. And Paul's like, hey, whether they do it in pretense or in truth, whether they do it with the right motives or not, the gospel is still being preached. And in that, I'm going to rejoice. So Paul just wants his church to know all that God is doing. God has a plan. God's good. It's okay. Don't worry about me. And that's where we pick up our text today. So the beginning of verse 18, Philippians 1 verse 18, this is where we left off last week. He says, in light of this suffering, in light of people who are preaching the gospel with impure motives, he says, well, what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So you're going to see as we study Philippians, this idea of rejoicing come up over and over and over again. And every time you see it, I want you to mentally remember and maybe circle it and write it down, that dude's in prison. Okay, this is not him like, oh, man, I'm blessed and highly favored. I just got the new bins and I have this incredible house. And if you just sow into my ministry, God will return tenfold. It's not prosperity gospel. He's in prison saying to rejoice. So we got to stop for a second and ask, what is that? Like, what, what does it mean to rejoice? What is Paul talking about? Merrill Unger says this. So when he says rejoice, he's getting at joy which is a fruit of the Spirit, one of the, one of the, uh, part of the fruit of the Spirit. Meryl Unger says this, Joy is a delight of the mind arising from the consideration of a present or assured possession of a future good. Let me read that again. Joy is a delight of the mind arising from the consideration or kind of pondering, thinking about a present or assured possession of a future good. So it's not, my circumstances are great and I'm going to rejoice. Life's so great, I just lost my job. My relationship's a mess. My marriage is a mess. My kids are going crazy. Nobody knows about this secret sin that I just hang on to. That, that's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying there's something in the future and I, that I'm, I'm rejoicing in. So to rejoice, if you take that, that definition of joy, to rejoice means not just to feel or experience but to show that joy and delight in your life. So Paul's saying that joy that I feel, this hope in a future reality that is mine, it's sure, and I feel that in the present, to rejoice means to give evidence of that in your life. To, give it, to, to, to actually show that joy and delight in your life. Now again, remember, rejoice always, that dude's in prison. Okay? So that's what Paul's talking about. That's just really quick. We're going to talk more about this because he's just going to force us to come to grips with this rejoicing thing over and over in this letter. That's what he's talking about here. Now look how he continues. He, he writes and then he kind of corrects himself. Look at this in verse 18. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice. Now look, he corrects himself. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus. First thing I want you to see this morning is that for Paul, rejoicing was a choice. He doesn't just say, hey, in this I rejoice. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. He, he's with the language of what he's saying, he's trying to help us realize that to rejoice for him, and hopefully for us, is a conscious decision to not just do it once, but to continue to do it, and to do it in every circumstance. He's not just saying, like, hey, I'm going to rejoice if I feel it, if I'm feeling good, if I got 
got up on the right side of the bed and everything with the kids were good and the coffee was good this morning, like I'll rejoice. He's saying, no, no, no. I'm gonna, he does, the language is, it, it, again, the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, so we, we miss a bit of what's going on here in the English. But what he's trying to help us see is like he's self-correcting himself. It's, it's not just that I'm going to rejoice. I'm actually, I'm going to continue to do this. No matter how this turns out, no matter how my prison sentence turns out, I'm going to continue to rejoice because for Paul, the rejoicing was a choice. Now, that's not the response we'd expect. I think if we were with Paul, we'd be like, you're in prison, Paul. <laughs> like, you don't have to. It's okay. It's okay for you to be busted up. You don't have to be perfect here. You don't have to fake like you're seeing the world through these rose-colored lenses. We'd be like, Paul, there's people who are preaching the gospel to shame you. Like they've picked up your ministry not because they believe in the risen Christ, but because they somehow want to just steal people away from you to make you look bad, Paul. What do you mean you're rejoicing? What Paul wants us to know Later on in chapter 4, Paul's going to tell us, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And what he wants us to know is he's not writing that from an ivory tower. He's not writing that from the life of one that's like, well, of course it's easy for you to rejoice. Your hands are as soft as a baby's bottom. You've never done a day of work in your life. You've not suffered. You've not been through anything. It's really easy for you to say that. He's saying, no, 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 I'm in prison. I'm rejoicing. I'm going to continue to make the decision to rejoice. For him, it was a choice. And I think we need to see that now. For him, it was a choice in spite of his circumstances. Because when we get to chapter 4, when he tells us, rejoice always. And I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in every circumstance. He knows, I think, that we're going to be like, oh yeah, Paul, nice one. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know how much I've lost. You don't know what I've lost. You don't know what's been withheld from me, Paul. How dare you tell me to rejoice? Paul doesn't just say, I rejoice. He says, I will rejoice. I'm going to continue to do it. For Paul, rejoicing was a choice. Why? Like, why was it a choice? Why is he doing this? Second thing I want you to see is that Paul had confidence not shaken by circumstances. Paul had this confidence in something that he's going to show us that was not shaken by his circumstances. That's why you can say again in verse 18. We'll continue on through the rest of the text. But just he says in verse 18, the second part of it, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Here's why. Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that what I won't be ashamed about anything, but that now, as I'll, now like in prison, suffering, not sure if he's going to get out, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul had confidence in the plan of God regardless of his circumstances. He was in the midst of some just, like, Paul went through, you know that person at the party who's like the one-upsman? Like whatever story you have, you're like, you're right, you got a cooler story. Like, oh yeah, you're right, your kid was crazier than my kid, and your parents were crazier than my parents, and that job you had was harder than mine. Like, Paul wasn't intentionally that guy, but he for sure could have been that guy. With all of us. Like, our, when we're like, man, I'm, I'm carrying this and it's really heavy. He's like, well, I was shipwrecked three or four times and I was out to sea for a day and a half. I mean, you just kind of like, okay, Paul, you win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's easy for us to think that we're somehow the exception to this rule. That like, yeah, Paul had a confidence in God that wasn't shaken by his circumstances, but man, my circumstances, it just makes it feel impossible what I'm going through. Like, I don't think we'd say it, but it, but it really is like, like God just didn't know how rough we'd have it. Like he's, he's having Paul write Philippians and saying, Paul, I want you to write, man, rejoice in, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then 
I think we kind of live like, he's like, oh my gosh, I had no clue what she would go through. What he would go through. And hear me, you're not meant to just attach from that. To see life through rose-colored lenses and like, oh, it's all fine. Because Paul actually says, I'm confident this is going to work out. And that confidence means I might die. He did eventually die, not, not from this imprisonment. He got out and preached the gospel for probably six more years. And then he was imprisoned again. Um, he didn't know that during this time. He wasn't like, oh, I, I know it's going to work out. It's all going to be fine. And he, he's, he's not... Like, so when he says, I know that this is going to lead to my salvation, he clearly isn't saying, I know that I'm going to get out of prison. Because he actually says right after that, well, whether by life or by death, it's going to lead. Like, Rome can kill me. Rome could let me go. These other people can keep preaching the gospel with impure motives to somehow shame. All that can happen. And no matter how it turns out, my salvation is secure. So whether by life or by death, he has that confidence. Either way, it's going to work out. Like, I want that. And often I don't have that. So like, hear me say, your pastor is not up here like, man, Paul rejoiced, I rejoice, y'all just get to it. I read that text this week and I'm like, man, like I know what some of you are walking through. And, and my prayer this week has been that you would receive the invitation from Jesus into a rejoicing that's different than your circumstances. Not that you would experience Jesus saying, hey, it could be way worse. Look at Paul. Look at that other person. You got nothing. Like, oh, that? That's not real suffering. That, that's not what Jesus does. You study the Gospels. Jesus is always present. He's always with people. He's not telling them, oh, it could be so much worse. I want this kind of joy. I want this kind of confidence that's just not shaken by my circumstances. I feel a bit, if I'm honest, I feel a bit like tossed to and fro by my circumstances. God, the day where I'm like, oh, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And then you get a phone call the next day and you're like, God has abandoned me. I don't think he cares about me at all. And then the next day you're like, oh man, you were faithful. You delivered, you showed up. That's part of the wrestle of, that's part of the struggle, he'll say at the end of our text today, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Paul had confidence not shaken by his circumstances. Okay, how? Well, like, I want that. How did Paul have that? Third, I think, yeah, third thing I want you to see. I didn't put numbers in my notes, sorry. Paul was faithfully present in life and in death. He wasn't shaken he had a confidence that wasn't shaken by his circumstances. How he was able to have that is because he was faithfully present in life and in death. Look at this in verse 20. Don't take my word for it. He says, my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And then in most of your Bibles, there's this really unfortunate paragraph break right there. There's a really important, so like in my Bible, it, the next part is living is Christ. So um, those, I'm going to take a bit of a break to explain this because I think it's a really unfortunate one in the text. The, um, the, the people who, who broke scripture down into chapters and verses and things like this, they use these pericope headings is what they're called. They're, they're like paragraph headings to let you know this is what's coming. Live, living is Christ. So here's what we believe about the Bible. The Bible is the inerrant, unmistaken word of God. That, that in the original manuscripts, Hebrew, Greek, some Aramaic, that that is the word of God. There's no mistake in it. God doesn't make mistakes. The pericopes aren't inspired by God. Like they're helpful most of the time, but they're not like, oh, God inspired lights in the world or living as Christ to be written. They're paragraph headings to help us. Now, I'm just saying this because I think Paul's in a really profound flow of thought that that paragraph, that paragraph heading kind of forces us to disconnect what he's about to say from what he just said. So I'm going to offer to you that that's really unfortunate because Paul actually continues his thought here. And I think it's really helpful for us to see that the next thing he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, is intimately connected to what he just said. So let me just read it again and I'm going to flow through it. But I, I wanted to explain that. Hope, thanks for letting me nerd out a bit. Verse 20. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed, 
about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. Like, I don't know if I should choose. I want to die and be with Christ or I want to live. I'm torn between these two. He's torn between those decisions, verse 23. I long to depart and be with Christ. That's why he says to die is gain, because it means he gets to be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh, to, to not die, is more necessary for your sake. Verse 25, since I'm persuaded of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Okay, let's ask the question, what is Paul saying and why is he saying that? It's really helpful in your Bible study, like tomorrow morning, open your chapter, work through it. What is Matthew, if you're doing read the book, what's Matthew saying and why is he saying it? Paul is, he, he's like, if, have you ever read a, a, a letter or a text from someone where you're like, it's just this like conscious flow of thought where they're chasing this idea out and kind of reasoning this idea out as they send you the letter, which in some ways you're like, why are you involving me in this? Because as you're talking it out, you came to the conclusion. That's exactly what Paul's doing here. He's saying, hey, whether, like, I know this is going to lead to my salvation, whether it's by death or by life, man, and the reality is for me to live is Christ. For me to live means I get to go on proclaiming the gospel, but for me to die is gain because it means I get to be with Christ. So you see in Paul, him like, well, which of those is better? Is, is it better for me to die so that I can be with Christ? Is it better for me to live so that I can continue to proclaim the gospel? He's like, well, to die is gain. So you can kind of feel, you can feel the scales. Paul in his mind, he's like, well, that actually is better. I think that's the one I desire. But then as he's thinking about it, he's like, hey, but if I remain in the flesh, if I stay alive, it's actually better for you. So Paul, with humility that he's going to talk a lot about in Philippians chapter 2, says, I think I'm going to stay alive. I think that's what I desire. All of a sudden, the scales go like this, where he's like, I'd rather die and be with Christ. But if Jesus spares me, it means, though I go on suffering in this body, I get to continue to walk with you in your faith. And he's like, so I think that's what Jesus is going to do with me. That is a kind of presence that I want in my life. That I can say whatever I'm going through, worst case scenario is I go to be with Christ. And that's gain. But if Jesus chooses to allow me to stay here, it means we get to keep running together and making much of Jesus and pushing back darkness. And so we're like, well, to live is Christ, to die is gain. This is the kind of thing that terrified the Roman Empire. The Empire of Rome hated the message that Paul proclaimed. And it's because he kept saying there's another, truer, better emperor than Caesar. If you've studied history at all, you know, like, it didn't go well for people when they talked about someone being greater than Caesar. And so it's, some of you have heard me say this, but it just, it blows my mind because I'll put myself in the place of Rome and just think, I don't know what you do to a guy like this. Like, hey, man, you need to stop it or we're going to kill you. He's like, man, to die is game. Great. I'm, I'm ready to go right now. Here's my head. You know, they're like, God, he kind of likes that. Let's not do that. We're going to let you live. We're going to beat you a little bit. We're going to torture you. We're going to put you, you want the box or you want the water? Like, what do you, we're going to torture you a bit, then we're going to let you go. And he's like, man, to live is gain. We're like, what do you do with a person like that? Like, you, you can't, like, Paul, we're going to kill you. Great, I get to go be with Jesus. We're going to let you live. I'm going to keep telling people Caesar's not the true king. They're like, Ugh. what do you do with a guy like this? Paul had the confident hope in, the, in spite of the circumstances he was in because he was faithfully present in life and death. He was like, life, great. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Death, even better. I get to go be with Christ. But that's just Paul, right? 
I think there's an objection that comes up for us that's like, yeah, but that's Paul. He was pretty impressive. Planting churches all over the place. I've never been shipwrecked before. I've never been shipwrecked and then gone and started a fire and been like, oh, God, save me. And then a snake jumps out and bites me on the hand. Like, that's a crazy story in Paul's life. I think our attitude is like, yeah, okay, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But that's Paul, right? Well, Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians 11, he's writing to this other church, and he tells them, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What you see in Paul's life isn't because Paul's amazing, it's because the one he worships is amazing. And when Paul writes to us, he's saying, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm imitating Christ. This isn't me just coming up with, I think this would be great. I'm going to live as gain and to die as Christ. Like that, That's not what he's saying. This is the attitude we all ought to strive for. So, in light of that, watch what Paul does. In light of us maybe thinking, well, it's just Paul. Look at what he does in verse 27. Very next verse. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul's charge to us is that we might live a life worthy of Christ. Now, here's a caveat, because this is where I think people can go. Like, okay, I, tell me how to please God. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do to earn my place on the team. I need to make sure that I'm in or that God loves me. Okay, tell me how to live a life worthy of God. We want to live a life worthy of the gospel, not to earn God's favor. So what Paul's, Paul's not about to, like, Declare the beauties of the gospel, that God set his love on you at eternity past and brought you into his family through no effort of your own, but only through the finished work of Christ. He's not about to pitch all that he's been preaching and say, now get to work so that you can stay on the team. What Paul is trying to help us do is say, this is what it looks like to respond to the good news of Jesus, to respond to the grace that has been extended to you, that God through no merit or effort of your own, set his love on you, sent Jesus to suffer and die in your place, rose Jesus from the dead for your victory and vindication. He's saying, because of what Christ has done, because Christ has made you his own, now follow him. And this is what it looks like to follow him. So how do we live lives worthy of the gospel? Look at verse 27. 27 to 30, he'll show us, and then we'll just pull out three things. He says, just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for, for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. Verse 29. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. So we're going to pull out three things. Before we do, I just want you to notice the togetherness of that passage. Paul is writing not to you as an individual, but to you as part of a family, part of a local church. He is writing to very specific followers of Christ at the church of Philippi. And though Paul wasn't writing to us, it is for us. And it is not for you just individually. All that stuff's plural. Eleven times in those verses, the idea of togetherness is repeated. Sometimes with the word together, sometimes the implication that the you is plural. Eleven separate times. I say that because I want you to know you don't have to do this alone. Living a life worthy of the gospel is not something that God places on you and then says, go get them, tiger. Go do it. Live a life worthy of the gospel. He said, no, no, no. You do this together. You don't do it alone. You don't have to do this alone. You can't do it alone. Lone rangers are dead rangers. You can't do it alone. So three things. How do we live lives worthy of the gospel? First, stand firm together. Stand firm together. Verse 27, just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord. Paul's saying 
regardless of what circumstances arise outside of you or within you, stand firm together. Don't do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. Part of the togetherness in this text means that there will come times where you're like, well, I can't stand firm. I've lost my footing. My life is blown up. I don't know what's going on in my life. Those are moments where you need to link arms with those who are next to you. Like, there's going to be moments in your life where you're like, I don't have the strength to stand up. I don't have the strength to stand firm. That's why you need people around you who can say, we got you. We're going to hold you up by your arms. This is what uh, Joshua did for Moses in the Old Testament. He held his arms up when his arms got too heavy. This is what Paul wants us to get. We stand firm, not together, not as an, or we stand firm together, not as an individual. Not as somebody who's like, hey, just go get them, tiger. Stand firm together. Second, strive together side by side. The end of verse 27 in the ESV, he, he calls us to, to be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Him saying this is like, man, fight for the integrity of the gospel. But don't do it alone. God's not tasked you to be the lone ranger out there who's correcting everyone's doctrine and you're off here and you're off here and you're off here. He is saying the good news of Jesus. Don't water that down. Strive together. And we're not just striving for good doctrine. Ray Ortland says like we need doctrine that also leads to culture. We, as much as we should strive for, we want to be people of the word. We want to have rich, robust, good theology. God has revealed himself to us. We ought to take him at his word. We also ought to say, and we're going to strive together to make sure that this is a gospel culture. That the way that we love and interact with one another is reflective of the good news of Christ. That we're patient with one another. That we're kind with one another. <clears throat> that we're long-suffering with one another, that we believe the best at one another, that we love one another. That's what Jesus says. Rayford is going to know, Fayetteville is going to know his love for them by our love for one another. So it's not enough to just have good doctrine. Like we, I, I think we have good doctrine. I think we have pretty good doctrine. I feel like, man, we've studied this out and taken it really seriously. But I've been a part of churches that had great doctrine. And when you walked in and saw how people handled one another, when they sinned against one another, or when they felt let down by the other, it's like, well, that doctrine isn't impacting the culture at all. Heaven forbid, like Jesus, protect us from that. I would hate what Jesus says to churches like that is return to your first love or I'm going to remove your, your lampstand. I think what Jesus would say sometimes is, hey, you, you got good doctrine? So do the demons. He says in James, you believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The demons have impeccable doctrine. It just doesn't lead to any life change. And what I want in this place and what we've got to, church, what Paul would say to us and what I'm saying to you is we've got to strive together for gospel doctrine and gospel culture. That we move towards one another in the midst of conflict rather than away. That we talk to one another rather than about one another. That when someone withdraws, when someone is running headlong into sin, we're saying, man, we love you enough. We're not here to shame you. We're not here to heap condemnation on you. We're here to remind you of who Christ is and what Christ has done for you and to bring you back into the fold. Let's strive together side by side, yes, for good doctrine, but also for doctrine that impacts our culture. Third, he says, suffer well together. How to live a life worthy of the gospel, suffer well together. Verse 29 for you've been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. That's how the New Living Translation translate it, translates it. It says, hey, you've been given the privilege of trusting in Christ. Ephesians says that even the faith to respond to the gospel, we can't, to the gospel we can't take credit for, that God actually gave us that faith. God actually opened our hearts to the beauty and the reality of the gospel and the depth of our sinfulness, gave us the faith to cry out 
in faith to respond to the grace of Jesus. And we've not only been given the privilege of belief, we've been given the privilege of suffering, which isn't easy. Jesus says in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous or take heart, the ESV says. I have conquered the world. Um, nobody likes to suffer. And I know a lot of you are walking through just the Lord has ordained some deep suffering for you. And part of my hope is that when people experience frontline church, I want them to say they talk a lot about Jesus. They love really well. And they suffer well together. Um, I'm not praying that God would suffer, spare our church from suffering. I'm praying that when it comes, because what Jesus says is that it will that we would suffer well together, that you would know and experience that you're not alone, that Jesus is with you and that this church is with you. And the message of Jesus and the message of this church isn't just get over it, it could be worse. It's we're with you. Jesus is with you. You're not alone, brother. You're not alone, sister. Look at how Paul ends this part of his letter. This is the last thing this morning. It says in verse 29, For it's been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Verse 30, Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. Here's how I know the, the tone of some churches and the tone of some Christians when they're faced with suffering is like you rank it by your own. And so you can't feel your own suffering because you can look at somebody else and like, yeah, but their story is worse. And you can't actually be present or gracious towards someone else's suffering because you're like, well, I've gone through worse things than that. Here's how I know that that's not the tone of what the, how the church should engage suffering. Because Paul doesn't end his thought. He goes right after it, right after it. Hey, we're going to struggle. We're going to suffer together. But you're engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. He tells the church at Philippi who is not in prison. Some of them would go to prison, but not all of them are in prison. Not all of them are suffering like Paul is. He says, you're engaged in the same struggle that I have. And it's because he can say, like Jesus told him, all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer in some way. Like, there's just no prosperity. Met. That, that's why the prosperity gospel is so appealing. It's so tricky. It's this, like, hack of Christianity. That if you just do enough, if you just give enough, you can guarantee your life will go fine. And that works until you get a phone call. I don't love it. But it's in the Bible, and I, I don't want to... I don't want to shy away from saying it. So here's what Paul's saying at the end of verse 30. Life following Jesus is a struggle, but you're not alone. The enemy wants to isolate you in the struggle. He wants to convince you you're alone. He wants to convince you that you've done, like that it is your fault, that you're alone, it's your fault that you're in the suffering that you're in right now, and it is your responsibility to get out of it. And what Paul wants us to know is that you're not alone. Jesus is with you. And we're meant to be with and for one another.